Okay, shall we take our seats and uh, begin our last, but certainly certainly not uh, least panel. I'm really looking forward to this discussion. Uh, Brazil has been in the news so much lately, uh, corruption scandals, illegal public uh, payment scandals, calls for impeachments. There's certainly a lot going on there. Certainly a lot of illicit financial flows we've seen in our reports somewhere around the uh, area of a billion dollars a year over the last 50 years or so, something like that. So certainly significant uh, challenges facing uh, the current government. We have an excellent panel uh, uh, today to talk about this. Dr. Ruggiero uh, Studart is with us, uh, Dr. Leonel Bolamequi, who we've spoken of the last day and a half, and our moderator is Adriana de Queiroz. Okay. Well, uh, we have the last panel and we have a challenge here. So many few people still waiting for the Pope to arrive. So um, I'm first introduce myself. Uh, I think a few of you know myself throughout the day and yesterday. So I am from Brazil. I work for a UK, U2 trade company that's a consultant firm uh, specialized on international trade and business strategy. Uh, yeah, a little bit about myself and how I got here and why I'm moderating this panel. A long, long time ago, I came to U.S. and for a couple of visits, and I chose some institutions with uh, some support from the Department of State, and one of them was an institution that uh, was in the back of the creation of GFI. And I first met Tom a long, long time ago that introduced me to this uh, project and I was very very happy and willing to have a study on Brazil and it finally happened last year. So uh, my background is uh, I'm an economist, uh, I did some research on education, on income distribution, poverty reduction and then I started working with international trade and came up to work with a think tank in Brazil where I had the opportunity to mix things, international trade, development, and all the so social issues that I started working and doing some research. And I was very glad that I illicit flows and development is totally connected. It, for me, with the, this international background, was a, a very good opportunity to be here. Um, about the topic we are talking today, trying to understand the illicit flows from Brazil, we have here two excellent speakers that they used to be, in fact, my professors in Brazil a long, long time ago, so I'm quite happy to be here with them today. And we're going to talk about the, not only the stud that GFS uh, did, but also their perceptions on these issues in Brazil and exactly if it's a real big issue or not. Uh, the study showed us that 68% of capital flights in Brazil are, in fact, illicit flows. It's a big amount. <coughs> Um, and it represents about one and a half percent of our GDP. And in the last 53 years, it amounted for $500 billion. So if we compare nowadays to the Brazilian scandal on Petrobras, uh, it's more than $30 billion, so with equivalent for more or less two years of illicit flows. Um, and most of these illicit flows that the study has shown is, as we've seen in the other countries, is related to misinvoicing. So we have a lot of multinational companies in Brazil that probably respond for most of this uh, misinvoicing. Uh, we, I, I know that most of the countries are aware of that, in Brazil including it, uh, but we don't know exactly if the Brazilian government has a huge concern on that so far. So uh, the GFI state came up with some um, suggestions on how to deal with this issue in Brazil. And I think it's in accordance with the OECD that came up back to 2003 that started having some recommendations on those issues. Uh, talking about increasing the transparency, also increasing the government cooperation, um, inhibiting the means invoicing practicing, and also to have some tax information exchange agreements with other countries that we already have, in particular the U U.S. will be implemented, I think, totally in two years. 
Uh, well, but to have all these targets reached, we have a step that it's the most difficult one, is to have the political will to reach all these targets. And I guess our speakers will cover what we have in the political side in Brazil, if we have the capacity to do it or not. And let me introduce both of them. We have here Rogério Studer, that is uh, an economist, he used to be the Brazilian repre representative at the International Development Bank for a long time, and now is based in Brazil, working for the Brookings institutions and other institutions here in the US. And we have Leonardo Burlamac that has already been mentioned here yesterday, and I'm not sure if this morning, but with the recognition of having d made the great support to the GFI from the beginning and g giving us the opportunity to have this discussion uh, in other countries as well. So it was a huge funding from the four foundations that in fact um, permitted us to be here today. So I'll invite first um, Leonardo to give us some 10 minutes. Okay. Okay, right. and then I will intro Okay, thank you, Adriana. Okay, uh, good morning, thanks. Uh, thank you, Raymond, thank you, Tom. Uh, great conference and thanks for the compliments I got uh, yesterday. I think you deserve more than you got the whole thing running. Okay, so let me uh, not get into the specifics of the Brazilian case because the expert here is my colleague, Rogério Studert, and he will probably tell you more about Brazil than, than I, what I could do. So what, I, what I'll try to, to do is to uh, try to make the case for broadening the focus of uh, global financial integrity uh, on the subject uh, of illicit capital flows in the future. And why do I say that? Well, because uh, in my, from my perspective, I would put together uh, both illicit and licit capital flows, and I would tie them to global financial governance, which obviously was the initiative that I was running at the Ford Foundation. So my perspective is this one. It's, it comes from sort of a global financial governance perspective. And from that perspective, I would say this, the, the subject of free capital flows, licit and illicit, it's a very difficult case for both domestic and uh, international cooperation. And in one sense, let me uh, just remind us of a few things that everybody knows, but the growth of illicit capital flows in not only in Brazil, as the study, as the great study that you just produced shows, the growth of illicit capital flows in the last three decades, at least uh, all over, is one of the most telling manifestations of the what I call a structural change that globalized capitalism went through. And by this, I'm, let me try to be specific, I'm speaking about the financialization plus private interests uh, driven re-regulation, which is known as deregulation. No, there is no deregulation, it's always re-regulation. What kind of re-regulation took place three or four decades ago? It was one that produced the industrialization of finance along with the financialization of industry. So this combination is an explosive one. And by private interests driven re-regulation, I mean giving private corporations, uh, financial or not, much more room to write the rules that will be applied to them. So, and the growth of capital, uh, capital flows, again, licit and illicit, I think illustrates the point because it falls in a complex intercession among domestic and international supervision uh, and regulation, tax authorities, financial regulators and, supervision, and supervisors, and 
tax shelters. Uh, here, I want to throw two facts that also come from the report. One refers to Brazil, and the other one, China. Okay. Brazil. Brazil, I think, has a very competent tax authority. It's good. And it has a good bureaucracy there, sort of a Weberian bureaucracy there. So we, it's not the case that we lack uh, the resources, something that came up several times here in the discussions. We do have the resources, and we also do a very decent financial regulations, especially if we compare with what's around, including the U.S., before the crisis, and I have no idea of what's going to come after Dodd-Frank, but we have very good financial regulation uh, in comparative terms. However, uh, we can see from the report that we had a capital flight was huge during the crisis, but also during the crisis, we grew. We ignored the crisis. We grew, and we had poverty alleviation during the crisis as well. So we had those things going together, which also applies to China. China is the first in terms of illicit capital flows. But it's also the first in development. It's the first in poverty alleviation. So those things correlate in a sort of a tricky way. What I think is the missing link here, so in a way, licit and illicit capital flows both, I think they pose several problems that were brought uh, already here. I'm just going to remind us of that. A f fiscal problem, of course, uh, less fiscal revenues. A financial problem much more volatility, much more instability. Uh, a moral problem, because the kind of example that it sets, the kind of behavior that it incentivizes. And, of course, a global, both a global and a domestic governance problem, which, in the end, I think we should refer to what Adriana just mentioned. It ends up as a political and a legal problem, if you will. So what's the missing link here, uh, in my view? The missing link is financial liberalization, which comes tied with lax tax regimes. If we have this, then it becomes extremely difficult to, one, to really know the numbers on what is really licit and illicit capital flows. This also showed up. Why? Because if we go to the trade-based, uh -huh, it's trade and, and, and financial, but the financial system is missing here. The banking system is the one that, okay, but we just heard from our colleague here. Oh, we go to the financial authority, to the financial system, we rely in the, inf the, in the information that they gave us about uh, a lot of the transactions. Problem is that the financial system itself, the banking system, is sort of helping the illicit capital flows to increase. They're not doing their due diligence. So the banking system, in that sense, it's more part of the problem than part of the solution. So if we jump from the trade-based data to the financial, financially-based data, it becomes much more complicated because we have derivatives, we have uh, exchange rate volatility, we have interest rate volatility. End of story. The banking system can produce whatever numbers they will. And it's going to be very difficult to try to really fact check the numbers that they produce. And they are the really global corporations. They're the, the, the criminals. Uh, the, the criminal networks, and the banking system. And the problem is that we have a globalized uh, financial system, but we don't have a global governance that is capable to deal with the same system that, 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 that's there, and it's doing all this. So in a way, just to finish those remarks and, and get the ball ru uh, running for Rogério to speak more specifically about Brazil, I think that uh, what we have right now, it's sort of a Ponzi type of capitalism, especially for the financial system. And if we have that, 
it's going to be really hard to deal with, again, both licit and illicit capital flows. And in that tone, let me just finish to partly as a joke, but just partly as a joke, to suggest that maybe uh, GFI could next step do a sort of uh, study on free capital flows, free finance-based flows as the most damaging problem for democracy and social justice worldwide. Thank you. I think, so, so uh, I, I can sit here, you can. I think. Uh, well, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for the invitation. Adriana, thank you for the kind wor uh, words, and uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be here again. And of course, thank you, Leonardo, for giving me uh, uh, the start from what I, want, I should be talking about. Uh, I was, uh, last year, I was, I, I was also uh, kindly invited, and uh, I read, I went through the, uh, the report on Brazil again that you have reproduced here with the numbers that are still, for me, uh, extremely shocking. Uh, so let me start from where I stopped in Brazil very quickly. Uh, the two points that I make broadly then was that, first of all, if you look at the numbers, uh, I, I thought that the, you know, the methodology and so on was uh, excellent. Uh, I look at num the numbers, I was astonished. Uh, I thought that something go over 1.5% uh, percent of GDP in cumulative terms, in terms of illicit uh, financial flows, was uh, had to be wrong, and uh, and uh, that 20 percent, uh, 21.7 billion dollars as as the average per earning uh, in in a period of 10 years, if I remember well, I was looking at that, uh, it could all only be an overestimated. Uh, of course, I was completely wrong, completely wrong on that. Uh, I have been. Uh, wrong on many things in the last one year or so, but this one here, I have to say, I apologize. I was totally wrong. Okay, but let me. The second point that I made there is that, uh, of course, both as a, as an economist and a citizen, I saw that I I took very seriously the issue of illicit financial flows. Uh, but at, as I look at the Brazilian cases specifically, that we were discussing in Rio, uh, I saw the way that things had been addressed in terms of illicit capital flows, uh, but also on, on general governance issues as, as a phase, as a, a part of a process of institutional building that Brazil has gone through uh, in the past uh, 30 years since its redemocratization. Uh, just for those who are not very familiar, we had a dictatorship for 25 years very dark uh, moment of, uh, of our lives, but also a moment of very bad governance that uh, had consequences uh, that lasted for at least 20 years. So, uh, so for, for us, 19, the end of 90s was the rebuilding of a few steps towards the institutionals required for a full democracy and, and a full market economy. Uh, first of all, we had the, the first phase in the process of rebuilding was uh, the creation, the recreation of, of uh, citizens' rights, which was in the Constitution of 1988. What rights uh, constitutes the, the rights of, of citizens? Uh, second phase was the creation of uh, a macroeconomic man management system that allowed for stability after so many years of instability. The first, the third phase had to do with addressing the issue of inequality and poverty, it's not just as a, as a government policy, but as a national policy, as I would say, a state policy, is when the nation comes to uh, view the issue of inequality and poverty as a central issue of the society that we have to address. So those are phases of the institutions. And then I said in Rio that I always thought that the, the fourth stage would have to uh, be the addressing the governance issues that have been building throughout many years in our society and that had created 
<clears throat> what now we call uh, endemic problems of governance. It's not just endemic corruption, it's endemic problems of governance, of how you deal with citizens' rights and obligations, the relation between the state and citizenship and so on. So I think that uh, what, or what I, I can say now, one year after that, and I only have six uh, minutes to make the case, is this. Uh, throughout this process, we have created several uh, ways of addressing the issue of governance. One of which has, been, has become very well addressed by the press, which is the mechanisms to the, the, the police within the judicial systems that was created to uh, pursue and to punish corruption. And that's where you start the whole process of analyzing corruption and the scandals that we, we, we talk about it. It's unprecedented in Brazil, and I would say it's unprecedented in many developing countries, the degree and the depth of the investigation that has been uh, done thus far. And if you remember what in Rio, what I said, one of the interesting thing that the whole process and the whole discussion of the endemic corruption in Brazil it started with, with illicit uh, capital outflows. Uh, it, was, uh, it was found out that there was uh, some movements that, that was traced using the database from the central bank and the, also the tax authorities that there were uh, uh, a specific individual that was sending too much money abroad and that was traced into the public uh, companies and from then on you start open up by a process uh, called, the, called the, 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 the witness protection assistance that you have in the United, uh, United States but in Brazil it's called the Lação Premiada. You start a process of open up and, and looking deeper into the several pockets of corruption. Now, it's interesting that he started with illicit capital, an investigation of illicit capital outflows, because in my point of view, and this is the fourth point that I want you to, to say, is that in my point of view, the illicit capital outflows and inflows have to do with, with uh, uh, facilitate endemic corruption in developing countries and in developed countries. And, 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 and therefore, it's not, uh, it's not unusual that you, you start looking at governing, in, governing issues inside a country by first stop, uh, spotting the issue of illicit capital flows. I'm quite sure that all those countries that you look here, those f four or five countries, if you start tracing the illicit capital inflows into the issues of endemic governance problems, you're going to find a lot to discuss in the society. Now, as an economist, we know, for instance, uh, the, the consequences of lift the clap of uh, 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 flows when it comes, for instance, to uh, making balance of payment constraints is even tighter. Of course, I mean, just make a point. If we had $500 billion as international reserves in, in our account, definitely we would have much, much better way to shelter the uh, international economic crisis that we have, we're facing now and most developing countries are facing, those countries that cannot issue uh, hard currency. The, the deterioration of the tax base, certainly it would be possible much, much more, uh, 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 the government would be much more prepared to address all those issues related to, for instance, social and economic exclusion if they had a, a tax base that allowed for an expenditure for increasing expenditure, particularly social expenditure. But I, this is the economist's point of view, of course, which has uh, social impacts. But for me, what has become very clear in the past years is that by being a conduit through it, you facilitate uh, endemic domestic corruption. You create uh, huge problems to long-term long development. Just giving a, an example. When you look at infrastructure investment, I was just coming. From, I'm coming from Brookings, and it's, I think it's an overall uh, view nowadays that one of the main constraints to development uh, in, in 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 nowadays emerging and also developing economies has to deal with the infrastructure gaps. Uh, infrastructure investment gaps lead to low productivity, low competitiveness, and low. <coughs> uh, social and economic uh, development in general, human development as well. But don't forget that infrastructure has also to do with, with, uh, with basic public goods uh, such as uh, access to good water, 
access to, 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 to appropriate uh, uh, sewage, access to schools, name it, it has infrastructure, and name it, there is a gap when it comes to that in developing countries. If you only look at that sector that is so fundamental for development, and if you look at the case of Brazil, you understand what we have missed in terms of development by uh, 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 allowing uh, endemic correct, uh, co corruption, not only to uh, lower the levels of infrastructure investment, but also to postpone and provide population with uh, a, what I would call, just, just to be generous, a sub uh infrastructure basis. It has created, it has affected the long, uh, the social, the long term social development of the nation, but also its capacity as an economy to create the jobs, to produce, to export, and to make uh, its own development sustainable. So having said that, I only have 20 seconds. I want to thank you again. I want to thank, I want to thank you for inviting me for the last time and, 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 and invite me this time even though I was so wrong. And I want to thank you for bringing forth this important discussion. I, and I would like to ask you to help us even further by uh, uh, deepening uh, your analysis of the relation between illicit capital uh, flows, domestic corruption, and, and development. With that, I think we would close that gap and make a, a significant contribution to understand the problems, in particular for Brazilians to understand the challenge that we have. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rosario. Before I open for questions, uh, I'll take the opportunity to raise some issues here with Leonardo that was quite provocative with the idea that, in fact, we have not to promote the, the liberalization of the capital industry. So uh, how do you see, in fact, because what we have seen in the last years, in fact, a movement uh, to liberalize the financial market, to have more transparency, integration, and in, at the end, what you're saying that it brings more problem to the social justice and all we are seeking for development. So we should be moving on the opposite direction. So you're quite provocative on what you're saying. Uh, what you suggest, or because it's difficult to see to step back in this issue. So what we should be doing in, in terms of working with all this movement of uh, liberalization and how we would deal with this. OK, yeah, I think we should go back in a way not in the sense of nostalgia and going back to Bretton Woods, but we should recognize that financial globalization went too far, especially because of those problems that uh, we are highlighting here. So it has to be reversed to, a, to, to some extent. And um, how do we do that? Well. Ma managing capital flows is obviously, and sh it should be, one of the key tools of macroeconomic or macrofinancial uh, instruments or policies in a globalized era. It's crazy that we have global financial markets, but we don't have global financial instruments to deal with those markets. So the markets, went, they, they go crazy, and the assumption is that they will self-correct. Boy, the crisis showed that's just the reverse, and theory also shows, not mainstream theory, but if you come from Keynes and you go through Minsky and to all the sort of macro-financial type of looking at the, uh, of how the, the, the economic system works, you will see, first of all, Finance is really the heart of the system. If the financial system, oh, and the crisis again showed that. If the financial system goes down, everything else goes down. So even Mr. Bush recognized this when Bernanke said, if we don't have that money, we might not have a financial system next week in this country here. That, 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 that became a famous phrase, right? So I think, yes, we have to go back and uh, reinstate some sort of uh, capital controls. Is this uh, crazy? No, I don't think so. Look at China. China still has capital controls. Um, Brazil still have some dismantled 
a lot, but uh, it could be done. The problem is that I would agree with you that the sort of the ideology and the sort of the, the, the whole outlook uh, is not pointing very much to that direction. To my perspective, perplexity, because all that we witnessed in the last seven years, five years since the crisis, should be pointing in the other direction. So just to close, uh, do, do I think that financial globalization went too far? Yes. Do I think that we should reverse it to a certain extent? Yes. Uh, the tools, uh, we, I think we have some of the tools, and it's just to make them uh, work. Problem is, political problem in terms of lobbying. Financial industry is extremely powerful here and there. But yes. Yes, you're right. We've been moving too slowly on after the financial crisis. And yeah, because transparency is good. But don't confuse more transparency with more freedom. Freedom of, of, of capital movements. It's completely different things. Thank you, Leonardo. Dev, do you want to mention this issue, or can I go and make a question to Rogério, and then I open? Yeah, it's up to you. Can I? Yeah. Okay. Rogério, you mentioned about uh, that we should be looking at illicit financial flows as um, behind the corruption process in the countries. Um, this is the main issue when dealing with illicit flows, that you should be tracking it to fight the corruption inside the countries. But when we look at the last panel on Russia, that we're talking about illicit flows, corruption, and how people on the high level positions in the country, how we would have some results from tracking these illicit flows in real terms. So how we are going to, to tackle this issue. We can identify the illicit flows, but in terms of real results in countries like Russia or China, when we don't have a very democratic uh, political system, so we are going to have a no end or no result. So talking about, in, about Brazil is a different case. I think you're right when you're talking about trying to identify the illicit flows and going back to connect it to corruption schemes. That's what happened in the Petrobras scheme. So it's how everything began. But it's a different country. You have read more um, strong institutions and the judiciary working very well, I would say. So should be this the, the main reason behind we should be tackling illicit flows? Thank you, Diana. I, th I think you have uh, uh, important points there. But let me clarify one thing. I, what I said was that illicit capital flows is a conduit, uh, not necessarily you know, the main reason, the, the, the main source of, 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 of illicit capital flows are the corruptions that, for instance, we're observing being uh, uh, investigated and punished in Brazil. You have, uh, you, you have all, like, all kinds of corruptions, uh, corporate corruption going on uh, that is associated with that. And you, you show that in your numbers. Uh, the, what, what I, and I, I think it is just it is a conduit which is mostly facilitated by regulations in developed countries. I think this is this is something that this is developed countries would do a great uh, would would uh, favor to developing countries, particularly those who have uh, less institutional capabilities, in enhance their regulations in dealing with the problem from here, for two reasons. First, one I have already mentioned is the difference of institutional capabilities. We're talking about we, when you talk about Brazil, we're talking about a country with a lot of institutional capability. But most, I believe, but I don't have, I, it's an endocto, but most of developing countries have very small capabilities to deal with the issues, particularly when the international financial architecture is so conducive, it's, it's so, uh, 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 well, it's so conducive to uh, allowing illicit capital flows. Uh, so by enhancing the, the, in, in developed economies, particularly those, and this is the second region, the reason, those with uh, a very important, very deep financial markets, such as uh, the United States, United Kingdom, uh, but also uh, uh, the, uh, Singapore and so on, uh, enhancing the regulations and the monitoring of, of, of capital flows 
uh, that would make uh, life much easier for developing countries. Now, it's interesting that, that Leonardo mentioned China, which, which is, a, is a, 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 in his right. And China still has uh, controls over capital flows. But China is an exception when it, when it comes to, it's a very big exception. It's the second largest world economy, but is an exception because it is, it, it is not, uh, it, it is a, a market economy with a very strong uh, political system, just to put it in a, in a political correct way. Uh, and therefore, the capacity to introduce that kind of regulation from within and maintain control is not comparable with any democratic market economy. Which is not a technical problem, is what you're saying. It's, it's a technical problem because in democracies, you have to deal, for instance, with, uh, with vast in, 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 uh, interests, different interests of different parts of society and, and, and the way that you yeah. address political uh, forces. For instance, the financial sector is very strong. So it's very unlikely that in a, in a market, in democratic market economy, in a developing country, uh, oh, sorry, I said that, uh, you have the capacity to influence from within the regulations required to introduce all the capital, uh, the, the capital controls that are required nowadays. I don't know if I make myself clear. I mean, the, in, in Brazil, for instance, it's, of course, you can always talk about financial sector using its power is not legitimate and so on, but this is part of the, the, the game in democratic economies. I mean, a government can do so much, even if the government had all the intentions, if the technocrats woke up in the morning and said, okay, let's do capital controls. First of all, the financial sector has a lot of political power from within, and the second thing, that. it has an incredible capacity to innovate, particularly if it's linked to their peers in countries, in developing countries, that have very deep uh, capital markets and very uh, 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 rich capital markets that are permissive to the innovations that are around, that allow you to go around the, 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 the regulations that exist in developing countries. The Brazilian Central Bank, for instance, and it's all, uh, the regulatory framework is very strong. But the institutional capa capability, even of the eighth economy of the world, like Brazil, is, is small in relation to the uh, capacity to innovate of those uh, in the financial market. It's a lot of money poured into very uh, uh, extremely uh, uh, powerful brains and in, uh, 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 to, to deal with that. You can find, I mean, if you, want, if you want to know why I have to pay my taxes in the United States at a level, I won't review it here because I don't even know, but it's very high. And, and, and uh, a former Republican uh, uh, candidate here only paid uh, uh, around 12%. You understand? Because he can hire the best brains in when it comes to accounting. So the financial sector in developing countries can also hire the best brain in terms of of finding ways around, and they have they, in case, uh, that are capable to connect to an international financial market that is also very permissive to uh, illicit capital flows. So I think it takes more; it's it's more the responsibility of developing countries to do that uh, than that of developing countries. Not that a country like Brazil should not be a part of that, because Brazil is not just a developing country; it's the eighth yeah. economy of the planet. Yeah or it's a G20 member. But remember, I mean, if we have that problem in Brazil with all the institutional capabilities that we have, imagine in other countries, I'm not going to mention any, that is much smaller, much less institutional capability, and, and can be very easily dragged by, uh, by uh, overwhelmed by the capabilities of uh, financial players. Thank you. Sorry, Bev. it took too long. <laughs> I just um, want to make a couple of uh, general observations. Uh, this model that I'm using uh, for all the case studies is basically an outgrowth of my doctoral dissertation back in 1982 on Brazil, uh, which uh, I uh, used successfully to get the, not only a degree, but also uh, do a working paper in the IMF at a time when the IMF was engaged uh, in a program with Brazil. So it was very sensitive, but still they approved it and the working paper was published. Uh, but um, the, the larger point I want to make is that 
based on the background research uh, on Brazil uh, that I had to do all over again to bring myself up to date, uh, I decided that there is a case uh, for studying both capital flight and illicit flows. So I agree totally with Leonardo that uh, in some countries we have to study both because um, you know capital flight becomes a very serious issue. There's nothing decent about capital flight. There's nothing decent about illicit, illicit money coming out of the country. It's very, very harmful. It's just as harmful as illicit flows. So we have to make, I have to make that call because although GFI, you know, we are focused on illicit flows, but I have to make the call that if I only focus on illicit flows, I might miss out uh, some important things sure. about that country. Yeah. And, and, and Brazil is a case in point. I mean, uh, people were concerned about capital flight. The president was making statements about capital flight, and including the IMF executive director was making uh, statements about yeah. capital flight from Brazil. So I had to tackle it. Uh, but um, the, the, the point here is that uh, the illicit flows are linked to the underground economy, whereas capital flights are, uh, capital flight is linked to uh, more the macroeconomic uh, drivers. So, th so that's the distinction I would like to make. Okay. But I did study both phenomena, by the way. Okay. Thank you. Can I just jump in for a minute because, Adriana, you asked me about, okay, what can we do? What can we do? A uh, couple of things we could do. For example, fiscal shelters. Why corporations, U.S., UK, European, all corporations, why private corporations are able, it's legit for them to j register on fiscal shelters. Why that's the case? Why, what's, what, 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 what's the added value that they bring by doing this? So can, could we do something about this? Obviously we could, technically speaking, obviously we could. Also, debt, debt, should be a problem of the debtor and the creditor. That's Keynes in his plans for reconstruction Bret Bretton Woods. It's not a new idea. Both parties are part of the problem and they should be held responsible. If we get into this seriously, we would have a different way of handling imbalances in the world economy. Number three, is there any serious study showing that financial globalization really helped boost growth? No, there isn't. So I think we have some good things to rely on. And just to finish up, Rogério, you mentioned, okay, in democratic countries it's more difficult, but then you said something interesting. You said, for example, the power of the financial industry, the power of this industry or the d food and drug or whatever. Well, if this is the case, I would have to ask a much more complicated question, which is, has democracy become sort of this kind of democracy that is not we the people, is we the corporations? Is this a sort of democracy that became sort of dysfunctional for handling uh, macro financial, global macro financial issues? It's not a sweet question to ask, but I think it's, it's fair to ask, to ask that question. Uh, well, okay, I, I want to say something, I cannot miss that. But I, it, it, democracy has always been dysfunctional, but it's still the best system out there. Uh, and what it takes is, 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 is to create the you know, the, the check and balance is necessary for that. So what I was trying to say is that to do that in developing countries is much more difficult than in developed countries for the reasons, for two reasons. Institutional capa capability, three reasons, I'd say. Institutional capabilities are low. Uh, uh, power, given that the relation between financial players inside and outside, power to uh, stop financial uh, players is, is, is also lower. And the third thing, because it's 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 much permissive, it's the the uh, international uh, financial architecture allows for uh, other ways to uh, promote uh, illicit capital outflows. That's that's the only point that I was uh, trying to make. Okay. To my reading, Leonardo, financial liberalization was as much as anything else a formula 
on the part of Western financial institutions to promote and receive flight capital out of your countries into our countries. That was, <laughs> that was the, the, the real underlying uh, motive of it. We agree on that. Yeah. <laughs> um, now, you have suggested that there are steps that can be taken beyond uh, um, transparency in the direction of capital controls. You've suggested getting rid of uh, um, financial havens, tax havens, uh, for example. We would, we would frankly interpret that as a position within our transparency agenda. What I'm trying to do is to, is to see if there's um, commonality or not yeah. commonality between what we pursue, which is transparency on the one hand, versus what you're suggesting, which is greater capital controls on the other hand. Are these, is this blurred between the, the two approaches? GFI is very focused on being pragmatic. In its, uh, in its recommendations, in being practical as to what um, uh, can be achieved. So um, I'm, I'm groping for curtailment on, on capital liberalization um, that is anywhere beyond the transparency measures that we're already dealing with. Are there, are there other measures that, would, um, that you would suggest? Well, I think this, this issue of getting into the relationship in between corporations and uh, fiscal shelters, it's not only transparency, but to say, look, this is, this is, should not be licit. Corporations should not be able to do it. Why they are able to do it? So this, I think, is something that should be uh, taken much more seriously. But I obviously recognize that much more international cooperation would be needed. And again, it becomes, after all, a political problem. So yeah, if you're, and then it goes sort of a challenge for GFI. Obviously, to be pragmatic is good, but don't get too pragmatic, because then you sort of, you, you cease to be bold, and you don't go beyond what you should be, like you should, should always be targeting much more than what you would like uh, to happen. And just to finish up, the other thing in a financial system which is quite weird, why are corporations also uh, able to set up special investment vehicles? where they move their stuff up and it off becomes off balance sheet. Why? Why on earth? Who, who gains with that? It's something that legislation could correct. Why it doesn't? So can we be doing, could we be doing more? Obviously. It is a political problem. Obviously. That's why I think we, we have to rethink the way the political system is structured. If it impedes those reforms, we have a problem. Yeah, I want to th hi, I want to thank the panel for a terrific presentation. Uh, my question is, back in the 90s, many of us had uh, both, I'm sure, inside and outside Brazil, had high hopes for the Workers' Party, broad-based democratic movement, modern. My question is, what went wrong? What went wrong in the Don't sense? Don't get me started on that. <laughs> no, but what went wrong in the sense that is it just possible that under the current international financial architecture that the pressure of big money, the pressure of international finance, the facility with moving these large sums of money back and forth, does that make corruption almost inevitable even for a party like the Workers' Party? Yes. I would say yes, precisely. It makes almost inevitable. Well, I think that you have to look at the symptoms. Uh, what you if you have to look at the at what uh, the the recent scandal in a historical perspective. Uh, what what you have now is in enormous, a, a much bigger capacity to investigate than you had in the past, mm -hmm. which does not excuse uh, the the government in in power for the the wrongdoings that have been done. In, in the, in the uh, throughout these years, but you also have to have to, to understand that the the political system in Brazil was created 
uh, under the assumption of, uh, of, uh, of capturing uh, uh, support. It has been that for a long period of time with the re-democratization we did not address the issue. Uh, there has been created uh, several uh, uh, informal and informal ways to maintain political uh, 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 cohesion and to allow governments to function. So that's what I was talking about when I said the, the problem of corruption is, is endemic because it's both between w within the state, uh, the government system, the relation between the state and the corporate sector, and between the state and citizenship. Uh, you have created a system that has to be uh, a, a government problem that has got to be addressed. And what you see now, even though you're talking about the Workers' Party, but what you see now, I think, is, is the, 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 the most intensive part of a process of dealing with endemic corruption that has existed in Brazilian uh, politics and corporations for a long period of time. Uh, not, I'm not saying that that's an ex excuse for a party that came to power exactly claiming that would address that systemic problem. I mean, the flag, and I can say that uh, 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 it, with, with a strong voice, I am one of the founders of the Workers' Party. At the age of 16, I joined the Workers' Party, and therefore, I was one of the founders. Uh, and I feel myself that the Workers' Party has failed simply because if the, there was a problem of governance that was associated with endemic corruption, it should be addressed by the Workers' Party because that was the main, uh, one of the main uh, proposals uh, and the difference in relation to politics as usual. Now, let, let me just add something. I would agree with both, but what we saw is the first time the, polit the, the, the PT arriving at the government and not wanting to get rid of it. And at the end, I think it found out that the only way to maintain power was to keep with the scam. What happened? Uh, things yeah. went too far. And things like, well, let's put it in a high other standard. So the kind of corruption, in fact, is bigger than it used to be, at least as far as we know. So they, they are checking it out. So uh, it's very sad to have the, 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 the work party in power and not being able to follow and to, to get what they, they promise to get rid of corruption, at least to combat corruption. In fact, they went inside the corrupt, corrupted system to survive in power. So it's a very difficult decision, I think, they had. So when you have all the scheme ready to work, what they did was to improve it. And having the pre-salt and all these opportunities at that time with the growth rates in Brazil and all the international system working in a, in a beneficial way, so how not to, to, to use the system? Can I, I, sorry, I became a little bit passionate for obvious reasons. But yeah, I, wanted to, I, want, yeah, I, want, I want to say something about what Leonardo and Raymond were talking about. I think we say, you say the same thing, yeah. to be sincere. I mean, what, if, if, if there's nothing wrong about a company open up, uh, uh, establish itself in another country. Uh, but when it comes to tax havens, because of the, uh, the fact that it's opaque, and that you can do cross operations within, and there's so little, there's so little accountability, it is possible for you to use that as a means of evading uh, taxes, of doing all kinds of illicit things. Mm -hmm. If increased, increased transparency, that would disappear immediately. My, uh, I've been addressed, I addressed that issue in the World Bank many times, because as the G20 uh, member, Brazil was also in favor of the, oh my gosh, I forgot the forum, what's the name of the forum, to increase this transparency on dealing with tax havens. But anyways, I, I, I can remember that. And I also represented Panama, uh, by the way. But the problem is that when you're trying to increase transparency and you're trying to address the issue, you do in, in, in asymmetric ways. And what I'm saying is that some tax havens are say, OK, we have this list, Panama is in it. But we don't want to look at other ones, and therefore it becomes a very unbalanced discussion. Uh, what you have to do, and I think that would solve the problem that Leonardo has been mentioned and Bremer has mentioned, is increase transparency in all this offshore uh, 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 
uh, banking sectors. And I believe that by doing that, they would just, many of those would just disappear immediately because they were created, you know, it's particularly to be opaque, not only in developing countries, but particularly in, in some developed countries, unfortunately, I have to say. Is this on? Diane Francis, I'm a journalist from, uh, from Canada. Two, uh, first, a comment, and secondly, a question. Um, I think that Brazil has to take credit for the fact that in my experience of covering all this stuff, it's probably the first Latin American country where a major scandal was generated out of the efforts of its institutions and not by the press. Feather in your cap. Very important to, to recognize that. Mexico's scandals just, you know, the, the reporter gets fired from her TV station. <laughs> uh, the other question is, um, those of us who are concerned about this kind of thing uh, in the developed world do realize that we're not doing anywhere near enough. For instance, the Canadian banks, the British banks dominate the Caribbean where all the dirty money is hidden. That never seems to change. Nobody gets upset about it. Uh, we have major money laundering facilitations, helping the Chinese buy condos in Toronto, Vancouver, and so on. What would you, if you had to pick three things uh, that would sanction behaviors by the developed world, what would they be in order of priority and importance? What should the developed world, how should they be punished, and how should they be restricted? Well, that's a really tough question because it will be sort of self-inflicted by, it will have to be self-inflicted by the developed uh, world. The governance system would have to change completely to do that. So. Uh, I think the measures that we were just uh, mentioning here would uh, ameliorate that, would get it to a much lower degree. I think it would be, ben it would be like utopian thing to think that we would be able to erase that. And just on a, a note on, on Roger, I think I obviously agree that more transparency would help a lot all this, but I would add more transparency plus new legislation, not only transparency, new laws. Just transparency. Yeah. You know, as the ones I mentioned, corporations cannot register in fiscal uh, shelters. Why, sh why do they have to do it, for example? Or they cannot establish special investment vehicles so that they would move uh, a lot of their operations in a way that they would appear as off-balance sheet or to limit vastly limit leverage and to look in terms of how leverage is being used to or nowadays uh, it's, uh, it's, it's possible and the Brazilian central bank does it it's possible because of the electronic infrastructure you can look at banks balance sheets on a daily basis, because everything can be crossed. If it's not, it's not a technical problem. It's, again, a political one. Because you can look, especially if the banks are big. If you have a system with 3,000 banks, it's difficult. If you have a system that's dominated by 10 or 12 or 15 banks, you can look at their balance sheets daily. And you can spot anomalies. All this is doable. Technically. Politically, it's a completely different story. I, let, let me say something about it. It's good that you're from Canada it, because it, it makes a point that I, I, was trying, it, it, uh, I was trying to address previously. Uh, can, Canadians are, are clearly critical about, the pro, uh, about, about, the, about tax havens. But when it comes to the government itself, it finds it very difficult to, to uh, not to support, for instance, the operations of Canadian banks in the Caribbean. Now, it's not because I don't believe that, of course, I'm not saying that, that there's no corruption whatsoever uh, in Canada, but the, certainly the institutions are very strong. I don't believe that anybody has to pay a, a government to defend uh, the tax havens in, with, uh, with Canadian banks because it's an important part of the economy. That's when in democracy it becomes so difficult for you to say, okay, I'm going to stop you from having 
you know, having a, a, an operation in, in the country where the regulations are, uh, are, are more permissive to, for you to do all kinds of opaque operations, right? Uh, what I'm trying to say is that if you could establish internationally stronger uh, uh, transparency standards and you could have independent boards to follow up on that, and to say, well, it's, it's not the Canadian government, the Brazilian government, and so on, but we are independent, and we, are, we have authority to say certain uh, 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 constituencies are not, uh, are not uh, uh, transparent enough to, to support, to have operations of any international bank, then things would be facilitated in terms ranking. of, yeah, uh, ranking and, and a, a clear a monitoring system. I find it very difficult in democratic societies for you to convince that an important sector of you're not going to defend an important sector of your country, and the financial sector has is is an important sector of most of countries. I mean, think about it. I mean, the, for instance, in the UK, and I, I strongly believe in the UK as a democracy. The financial sector is, is one of the most dynamic industries. Are you going to are you going to convince any government left and right? that you're not going to defend uh, 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 tax havens promoted by uh, British, uh, British banks in, 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 in the Caribbean if they say, well, this is so important for the most dynamic sector of our economy. I think that the best way for you to address that is to say, OK, we're going to allow you to do that, but in a transparent way. Show us the operations and show us that you fall in some criteria that uh, you know stop uh, uh, would stop illicit uh, kind of operations, and by doing that, you're going to see the next thing: that tax havens are going to start disappearing. One more question here. Yeah, take that back. After this. You I'm sorry. Um, okay, just a second. Leonard is going to leave yeah. anytime soon, so if he's not here to answer, if you if yeah. you want to add question something, your last. Yeah. Okay. I was just. Uh, Remembering uh, an occasion, it must have been at least 20 years ago, uh, where I was uh, reporting on um, agricultural commodities, mm -hmm. and there's a private, co privately held, okay. very large. Your question is for me. No, it was, no I, I thought you were about to leave, so. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. So you're, you're yeah. okay. So okay, I will. Thank you. Do you want to say something? Uh, I, I was going to thing? say that you're completely wrong, but I'll explain to them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't stay. Okay. Don't stay. Okay. Any kind of words? No. <laughs> I can't remember if it was Brazil or Argentina, but yeah. um, there or was there is Cargill. Uh, was <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Cargill was an American yeah, company. You. It's American company. It's privately held, and so it has virtually no transparency. It bought wheat. I think. I'm not, I can't remember if it was Argentina or Brazil, probably Argentina, but it bought the wheat in bulk, shipped it to the United States, milled it in Cargill um, factories in, in New Orleans, and then sold the wheat to Egypt under a U.S. federally subsidized program which was called the Food for Peace program, which was established after World War II to support uh, U.S. allies and democracies and make sure there was enough food. It, so basically they were using U.S. tax dollars to support this, this sale. Um, and uh, there was absolutely nothing illegal about it because nobody had ever imagined it would be cheaper to bring in wheat from outside the United States than to ship it down the Mississippi. But I, would, I proved it through fish... Uh, Shipping records, basically. And uh, when I called and asked them for a comment, they were very rude about it. A week later, after the story went out, and the congressional investigations got started, and wheat farmers were picketing the, the grain, Cargill grain elevators all over the country, suddenly Cargill's CEO and chairman apologized within a week, apologized publicly to the wheat farmers of America for this unfortunate oversight that some low-level trader had uh, overstepped his bounds, which is, of course, not what they said a week ago. But that is how fast it's possible for uh, you know, a certain 
a fairly simple amount of light publicity can change a, 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 a discussion. And this was, these were, this Cargill is not a company that answers to anybody except its, its own internal board. It's not publicly traded at all. So I, as I just was going to say that although transparency seems, to, you don't want it to be a, the end all and be all of everything, it still seems to be one of the biggest l levers you can use to push. But I, at the same time, I'm concerned and wondering what you think about situations where the transparency is also running into things like in Brazil where there's still such an unease based on past history in trusting that the money is safe or the family, you know, that people had family money stashed o outside the country in case they'd had to leave in a big hurry. I mean, how much of this is rebuilding trust in the country and its institutions? Well, first of all, uh, what's your name again? I'm sorry. I'm Terry Sprackland. I'm an international reporter with Tax Analysts. Uh, well, I could not hear your name. Terry. 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 Uh, Terry, I love your story because it, it's, it says something. Well, once you have transparency and you have free press and free public opinion, even if that, what happened was legal, you would say, okay, this is not right. If it's not right and it's taking money from, from, from our tax money, we should change the law. That's why I think transparency and democracy comes even before the change of regulation. How can you decide how you're going to change the regulation if you don't have the information and even if you don't know what is right and wrong and what, how, how, you want to sit, how the citizenship wants to change regulation, okay? Uh, I, I love that story because it, it makes the point that uh, Raymond and Leonardo were saying as the same thing, but with different sequencing and the need for the institutions for that sequence to happen. So I agree with you. Transparent for, transparency first, then evaluate what, if, what is illegal or legal. And when it's legal and you don't like when it's not right, change the law. Okay? That's, that's the sequence. Yeah. on licit or illicit clause as well. So morality maybe it's changed in different countries and sometimes being legal is not enough. So if it's immoral, so. This, this is the second part that I love of the story. And I say this said it beautifully. It, because it, 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 you're touching the issue of Brazil. Now, in, when you have for so long uh, problems of governance, uh, corruption becomes business as usual. People start accepting corruption at different levels. So what is, what is it wrong if I, for instance, if I sell my apartment in Brazil and I, I sell it for a lower price because I want to avoid taxes, and why not have somebody to deposit my money in, in Miami? Now, I can give you a number of, of, uh, of, 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 uh, of examples that, that I heard people saying that, and I was like, because this is all wrong. This is all wrong. The whole structure is wrong. But people start accepting that as business as usual. Uh, uh, the same thing as people accepted until very recently that someone working in your house uh, in Brazil as a domestic uh, servant could leave it as a slave and make as, as much money as a slave would have and be there, and that's a longer story, be there for you at 6 o'clock in the morning to make your coffee and leave the house, or when they leave the house, at 11 o'clock uh, at night just to prepare your meal. People thought, 20 years ago, people thought that it was normal. People also thought in Brazil it was normal to have a sign in the elevator saying, uh, servants, please use the service uh, elevator. A and it was discriminated because most, 99% of the servants, well, first of all, this is socially uh, unacceptable. The second thing is 90% of the servants were black. So that's, that's the kind of society that Brazil was 20 years ago. It has changed completely in 20 years. Now, coming back to the present, what we have in this is a shock treatment of what is ex ex should be accepted or not as, as, as life 
as usual, business as usual. It goes into the relations between uh, the, uh, uh, the government, its, its, its coalition, the relation between the state and citizens, the relation between the state and, and governance, the relation between civil society and, and, and all other parts. What we are having is a, is a very intensive course in looking at ourselves and say, what is illicit and what is not uh, illicit in a democratic modern economy? And because we had to do it such a short period of time, uh, and you said it, uh, because the institutions that were created allow for that to happen, it has become so traumatic. The, uh, you have people going to jail, you have the society astonished, you have a government falling apart, but at the same time, you have a very, very rich moment when the nation is looking at itself and said, we have done business for 500 years, we should not be doing it this way. And I think this is what gives me hope for this process. It's traumatic, but uh, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, Rosario. Uh, I'm going to close the panel. I think you have got to the end. No time left. I'll uh, thank you again for you to stay here. And I expect what's coming for GFI future in terms of the new studies and what you're going to tackle as you have raised a lot of information from different countries. So good luck and hope to see you again in another opportunity.